strictly Jewish phenomenon, then the Gospels never would have been written in Greek. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And and so obviously these the, these texts or, or these stories, for lack of a better word, um, were meant were meant for the wider world. Well, and you stop and think about the just the serendipity of it all. Um, the Roman Empire, uh, for all intents and purposes, was a global empire. I mean, absolutely. Uh, at least through all the way through Europe uh, and into mm-hmm. Asia. But they they made roads. They made their mm-hmm. everything was interconnected, so you could travel and word could spread yes. quickly. I mean, there were there was organization, and there was granted they were despots and they were uh, tyrants, but there was an order right. to civilization well, every, at that time. Everybody was despotic and tyrannical at that point. Yeah. That's you know? how you ran things. So, yeah, that's that's the way the world worked. So <laughs> so. so that that's the gist of this opening prologue. Is John is mm-hmm. saying you know. It's laying what I believe aside, I think we can easily say what John know, what John believed. John believed Jesus was God, and that's his case. Yes. He's, and the rest of the book is going to is a supportive role to that statement. So, right. I put up a short little video. That says, all right, if if Jesus is God, as John okay. says, whether or not you believe it, if Jesus is okay. God, what are the implications? Yeah. And that's yes. kind of where that's kind of where I'm leaving it because if Jesus is God, to me the implications are monumental. Mm-hmm. And if Jesus is God, then everything He says is important. Everything He does is important. Jesus doesn't do anything by happenstance. If He's God, everything has a purpose. And it raises a question. Of course, you and I know the answer to this, but it raises a question that some of my friends have brought up. If Jesus is God, their biggest question is, why why this? Why does he have to come to earth and then mm-hmm. get killed? What's the deal with that? Why would God, and then of course the big question is, how can God be on earth and in heaven at the same time? Uh, yes. Trinity talk. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, and and of course, the the that's been the big sticking point with the whole Unitarian idea. You mm-hmm. know, the, the Michael Cervetas, um, you, you know that that they just saw it as something wholly illogical, and I I think we could make a very logical argument for the Trinity. Now, you know, whether I believe it or not, that's that's that remains to be seen. Right. You know, um, but but I can logically understand the Trinity. It's to me you know? I, part of part of the. It makes my brain hurt, but because mm-hmm. I've studied this in depth, and I started off understanding it, and the more I studied it, the more my mind just starts to crumble, <laughs> and mm. I just wah, yeah. I get twitchy. But in my in my brain, I'm very visual. In my brain, I have an I believe box up in the upper right hand corner of my brain. It's right up here, right up there, mm-hmm. and in that box are the things that I believe and don't get. I mean, there's lots of things that we believe that we don't understand. Absolutely. But we believe not everything we believe has to have a foundation of total, complete knowledge, I guess is my point. And mm-hmm. uh, Jesus says later on in John chapter 3, he says, he's talking to a Pharisee, and, he, and the Pharisee says, well, how can this be so? The right, a question about being born again. And Jesus says, mm-hmm. the wind comes and blows through. You don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going. Mm-hmm. But you know what it does. Mm-hmm. That's faith. That's belief. I might not understand everything about Trinity and God and uh, and everything about him because he's huge and I'm not, but I can see what he does, and I can see the results of him, mm. which makes me believe in him. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And so there, there's a point where um, book knowledge, you have to realize that Christianity is a mystery religion, I think. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Well, well, it might be useful to explain what you mean by you said mystery, right? Yeah. Well, bi- okay. a, a mystery religion has mysteries. In my mm-hmm. mind, uh, any every religion on the planet has a line at which, if you step over that line, you step from logic into preposterous. Sure. And that yeah. whatever that faith is, it it really demands that you accept the preposterous sounding thing. Right. And just because right. you don't get it, that doesn't mean it's not true. Right. 
That's so a mystery religion has that element in it. And I believe Christianity is the ultimate mystery religion because mm -hmm. it asks you to believe that God could exist as a father, a son, and the Holy Spirit in a triune, in a triune being. It, mm -hmm. He asks that you believe that God would come to earth and allow himself to be murdered by his creation mm -hmm. in order to purchase salvation for them. Right. I've been a Christian 42 years. I don't have a problem with that. But when I talk with my friends who aren't Christians, they go, what? Yeah. What the what? Nah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's stupid. But, <laughs> <laughs> but so that's right. what I, that's kind of what I mean in mystery religion. There's an area in which I, I believe we'll always be getting smarter, and I might be able to answer all my questions about the Trinity down the road. But right now, it's in my I believe box up here. I open up the box. I look at it every now and then. It goes, all right. Yeah. No, nope, still don't get it. Put yeah. it back. Well, this is how, how I view the Trinity, um, and I've said this before, but uh, you're recording today, right? Yes. That, yeah, yeah. So, so the way that I acknowledge the Trinity is, is the idea of like a video game. You know, that when you're playing a video game, you are both the character in the video game and you are yourself at the same time. And so maybe we could think of like the Holy Ghost or the Spirit as like the transmission between the two, you know, <laughs> that. I've never it, heard it, the it, video game thing before. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, from that standpoint, you, you, and of course, we can only make that analogy in the last, what, like 30 years or so, you know, 40 years. Um, so, uh y yeah, from that standpoint, it's very easy to imagine, you know, God in heaven and Jesus on earth being one and the same at the same time. Um, and then, of course, you know, and just like a video game, you know, the character, your character can die. Um, now, you, you know, that may sound in some way like that's trivializing the relationship between yeah, but God you, and Jesus. But, but when it comes to something this big, anything you say is going to be trivial in comparison to the well, real. Okay, that's fair. So, yeah, I, so I totally get what you're saying. And and as far as the preposterous goes, we encounter the preposterous on a daily basis. You know, we have concepts for things that we cannot understand. We cannot understand infinity, but we can conceive of inf infinity, mm -hmm. right? And same thing with nothingness. We can we we can conceive. We we have an idea of what nothing is, but we cannot understand nothingness. Right. And by the same token, we have a conscious being, right, that that mm -hmm. somehow inhabits us. And and um, and y y your uh, your materialists, I think, would say, well, you know, that the consciousness is emergent from the physical brain. OK. Oh, <laughs> except, yeah. It, except there's a problem with that. Right. And the problem is this. If consciousness is emergent from the physical brain, then why is the brain subject to the consciousness, right? So meaning we can actually change our brain based on our thinking. Right. Right. So the brain seems to be the servant of the mind and not the other way around. And why is that? How do you explain that? Yeah. What is that spark? It has to be, yeah. it has to be, have divine origin. Right. Or, or it's something that we can't conceive of again, you right. know, if it's not divine, it's, you know, who, who knows? Well, I, I mean, it, you know, in that d the divine is something that is far, that, that is far above and beyond what mm -hmm. we're capable of. Well, you know, I of, used to, somebody used to ask me about Trinity. One of the th ways I explained it, and I only explained two thirds of it because and I can't seem to bring the third element in, but maybe you can help me with that. I say, it's like if, um, if I, if I write a book, I'm an author of a book. I've written this book. Okay. As okay. the author of this book, I know everything all at once, beginning, mm -hmm. middle, and end, all at once. Yes. If it's an autobiography, my character in this book only knows it a page at a time. Page mm -hmm. only knows August 20th, 2018. He doesn't know yeah. August 9th, uh, 21st yet. And mm -hmm. so as the author, as God, the author of all life, mm -hmm. that's he stands outside of time. That's my concept okay. of eternity. At, he's like the author of a book. He knows beginning, middle, and end. It's all now to him. Whereas right. me, I'm only I'm carrying through one page at a time. And mm -hmm. I don't know I won't know the final chapter until I get to the final chapter. Where, yes. So 
that's one of the ways I try to exp I explain eternity and the eternal nature of God and how predestination might work. Oh, please, let's not go there because that's a, that, okay. There's sure. a there's that's a fine. minefield there, but uh, <laughs> but but you right. you know what I'm saying is that I do the yeah. eternal God knows everything it all at once now. So mm -hmm. that's why one of the names for Jesus in the New Testament is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Right. He's beginning and the end. So, yeah. but it, but what's amazing to me in, in this, John, the first chapter, if Jesus is truly God, then all this stuff we're talking about takes on incredible significance. Um, mm -hmm. You said you've read some C.S. Lewis. Have you read, uh, let me pull this up here. Um, have you read, let's see, da, 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 where are you? There you go. Um, recent. Have you read his Lord, Liar, Lunatic statement? Well, um, I am familiar with it. I did not read his account of it. Okay, it's it's but, mere yeah. it's, it's from mere Christianity. I'm going to read it aloud right here. I, yeah, cause I'm, please do. Yeah. That's actually going to play a part in my next uh, uh, thing because I'm actually studying Pharisees and Sadducees because they sent a, a bunch of people to John the, the Baptist to hammer on him. And so okay. uh, this plays into that. But C.S. Lewis said it, it came from a series of uh, BBC radio lectures that he used to give. And he used to be on the radio um, doing apologetics to people who aren't Christians. He wasn't. He never spoke. He wasn't speaking to Christians. He was mm -hmm. talking to non-Christians. He's trying to use logic and right thinking, right? So he uh, he says, "I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say." A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either, either this man was and is a son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or... You can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He didn't intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was ne neither a lunatic or a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Okay. That's his, that was his Lord, liar, lunatic thing. And... Right. Uh, I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he uh, he had such an extraordinary conversion story. Um, you, you know that that spoke to me um, even you know even in the depths of my disbelief. You know this idea of just like wrestling against God. You know, like like he's Jacob or something. You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, okay. Well, let me. Can I play devil's advocate? then oh absolutely not no <laughs> yes absolutely so, well now, then. this is not mine this is not mine unfortunately i don't remember where i got this from okay but i do remember i saw it on youtube so maybe um may, maybe uh, i can do a search after this but it was the lord liar lunatic but c.s lewis forgot one what that legend that it was a legend Yes. So, so the the thesis, the general thesis, um, and this this is this is sometimes trotted out in the atheist community, um, is that Jesus was euhemerized, right? Meaning that he he probably was a charismatic rabbi at the time, um, and uh, and that he was a great teacher, um, but over time, not of his own doing, mm -hmm. but over time, more and more was ascribed to him, and um, and and that is that that's brought out in the belief that in um, Matthew or Mark, I always get Matthew and Mark mixed up. Anyway, the first gospel, the the, the, the oldest yeah. one, Matthew, yes. right? Jesus is it, his miracles are very nondescript, also. The ending of Matthew is is by most Christian scholars deemed to be non-authentic. Mm -hmm. You know that somebody wrote that in because they thought it should have been there. Um, 
And so if you look at the at the Gospels from the oldest to the newest, to where John would be the uh-huh. newest, and Jesus is certainly at his most miraculous in John, right? And okay. so he grows in miraculousness, right, as the Gospels progress. Right. Um, so so that was that that was the rebuttal to that now of course you know i'll if i could do one more devil's advocate against my devil's mm-hmm. advocate is that <laughs> the, oh you didn't tell me you, you didn't tell me about all these other personalities inside i know i know it's true yes yeah yeah it's all, all of my internal lawyers fighting um <laughs> that if in in the span of time Right. If these miracles and 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 um, the more John esque qualities of Jesus were witnessed and were common knowledge, it wouldn't be that important for the followers of Jesus to have them written down. Right. It would be enough to just say he performed miracles. Well, yeah, we all heard he performed miracles. So it wasn't necessary until John to write them down in specifics. Right. Yeah. So, OK. Well, you know, the other thought that occurs to me is that uh, the very fact that they were written down, um, and I'm not sure I agree with the with the fact that his miracles in in Matthew were pretty generic. I'll go back and look at that. That's pretty. That's a that's an interesting point of view. Well, but I, I, I nondescript, right? And well, like when he feeds four thousand people with a couple of fish and 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 that's and true. With I guess he went to Britain, got some fish and chips, and fed fed four thousand people, but. <laughs> Or Not where, even Jesus. Yeah, where he feeds the five thousand, <laughs> the parable of the net. Uh, see, well, let me go back here. Um, yeah, where he throws out demons and whatnot. Um, the man with the withered hand. That's a pretty descript. That's not general. Sure. But my sure. my point is, is that what's amazing to me is the absolute silence in written records of that day rebutting these writings mm-hmm. because Christianity was exploding, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. For a short time, it was they were in the synagogues and they were exploding. The movement was yeah. just, I mean, supposedly on on uh, uh, the after the Holy Spirit fell in, in chapter of Acts, Peter preached and three thousand people were saved. Boom. Sure. That's a significant congregation. It is. And it absolutely is. So this movement was exploding. So the time to shut this down would have been at the beginning when these ridiculous claims were being made. And the fact is, history's documents are incredibly silent. The Jewish yeah. people who were totally vested in disproving this, uh, the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the priests, um, mm-hmm. they were vested in destroying this myth before it got started. They're silent on this. Yes. They say nothing. Josephus has a couple mentions about Jesus historically, mm-hmm. enough so that we know that Jesus really was there historically. He was a historic visage. But when these things came out and were making their ways around, the time to disprove them would have been then. because But they couldn't. Why? Because there were eyewitnesses. Right. You can't dispute. Uh, it's like the, the, the one person that uh, the, um, uh, the blind man that Jesus healed, they said, go to the temple and present yourself. And mm-hmm. they start questioning him. And they say, they asked his parents, is this your son? And said, yeah. And then they looked at him and says, who did this to you? Why would he do this? And he said, and the blind man's response in, in essence was, wow, I'm kind of surprised. Um, I would have thought you'd be happy with me. He says, I don't know mm-hmm. anything except I was blind. Now I see. Yeah. Boom. You can't, and they couldn't do anything because there was an eyewitness, the man who had his eyes healed standing in front of him. What are they going to do? They're religious leaders. They can do nothing. Yes. And when John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke did their Gospels, and Paul, now Paul had been a Pharisee. Paul wrote some pretty astounding things in his epistles. He mm-hmm. tried to go to the Jews and preach to the Jews and take what he knew about Jesus to the Jews, and they just totally rejected him. But they never beat him verbally. Mm-hmm. You know, it helped that he was a genius. <laughs> I think I think he's probably one yeah. of the most brilliant men of all time, but so to me, my my answer to that to that atheist argument was the truth is there is no rebuttal at the time. Mm-hmm. It's easy to be here two thousand years later. And say, oh, they just made that up, oh, right? But if you understand anything about how the Bible was transmitted and written, and 
how if you do histor if you do some historical uh, uh, crit uh, textual criticism, then you understand that the Bible is an incredibly it's an amazing book. In yes. fact, there's uh, more proof to back up that what we have in the Bible was the original words than there are to proving that William Shakespeare's sonnets were written by him. Well, that yes, that that is certainly true. Although I don't know if that speaks to the validity of the Bible as much as maybe the Christians hope it yeah. does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, but I, uh, I, I think so. One thing that's that's also important to understand, I think, or to keep in mind, is that the Bible may very well be the single most studied text in the entirety of human history, right? And that, yeah. and that means something, you know, maybe the only, the, the only things that could rival it, and I don't think they do, right? But uh, again, if I'm just like spitballing here, maybe the I Ching, maybe the Analects of Confucius, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Bhagavad Gita of, of, of Hinduism, but not, but, but these, these, these texts are specific within cultural confines. The Bible, whether you find it in Africa, Europe, you know, um, the, the indigenous native Americans, mm -hmm. you, you know, who, whoever it is that is studying this apart from their cultural ties to this area of the world, that's really quite small, right? Because Rome had virtually nothing in common with the Jews, Correct. you know, and, and England, you know, is even farther away from Rome. Right. And so the fact that all of these people have devoted the last 2,000 years, I mean, could you imagine trying to build a library that housed all of the Bible commentary that has ever existed? <laughs> there, no. there is no library large enough, uh -uh. right? So, so this has to be taken into account, right? That if, it, that, that if it is so inconsequential as, as, as many critics would, would like us to believe that it is, um, are you saying that every single one of those scholars that that could fill libraries and libraries of criticism were just simply superstitious? I mean, you can say what you will, but the idea that these minds, generation after generation, could be devoted to something as much as they were on on, on the basis of a superstition, I think, is really quite um, un humanistic of you right if yeah. you are a secular humanism yeah <laughs> you know well yeah so. and and, then, and with all the attacks on the on the philosophical angle and historical angles and textual criticism angles mm -hmm. it's still here it's still yeah. standing so yeah all right yeah. i i like that yeah, yeah to me it's it's almost like uh in my mind it's it's not what's said that supports it it's like what's not said to me it's Mm -hmm. they haven't beaten it back yet. And if this was just a myth, you know, eventually a lie falls down. Even yes. if it takes a generation yes. or two, yes, a lie falls down. Um, I remember growing up, I could only hold a lie so long before my dad found out. Absolutely. So, so there, there, here's a story that, that I think illustrates that so perfectly. Um, in the Zoroastrian religion, um, you, you are judged on your deeds um, upon your death, right? So, so your, your good thoughts, your good words, and your good deeds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you are judged to have been a bad person, uh, after you die, you are walking on a bridge until that bridge becomes so narrow as to be a razor and you're walking on this razor um, and being tormented by this this old hag who is the representation of your of your mis your, your misdoings right. until you fall into eternal hell because you cannot stand on that razor's edge now if you take that on a metaphorical level right when you are a, when you lie you are backing yourself 
into into various corners because you have to invent new lies to support the old lies right so the the road of of navig navigation right becomes sharper and sharper it becomes you know you, you become more and more cornered until finally you're tormented and you fall into hell Right. Because the truth will eventually come out and you will have to reap the the, the, the discipline of that. Right. Oh, that yeah. makes wonderful sense. Yeah. So yeah. the implications are pretty huge, aren't they? If yes, if Jesus really is God and this book is to be trusted, John's letter to be trusted, then I think the next however many chapters of John, we got 20 chapters of John are going to be momentous. And I agree. And I think they're going to have, I will say, it changed me 40, 40 plus years ago because when I realized that Jesus was God, when I came, when I came to agree with John that Jesus was God, um, it changed everything about how I live. Because if Jesus is God and he loves me and he wants to change me, I should be changed. Yes. And if Jesus is real and God is real and the Holy Spirit is real and their promises to change are real, then I should be changed as a person. Because right. the Bible says that the Holy Spirit changes you. God comes in. He changes. Every, almost every other religion, when I looked into it, mm -hmm. they have a standard of excellence they want you to attain, a morality that they want you to attain. Yes. And you work to attain that. That's great. Christianity was weird to me because mm -hmm. Paul says in, in Romans, um, all of us fall short of God's glory. There's mm -hmm. not one that doesn't. Everybody has yeah. sinned and deserves the death due as a penalty of your sin. So if no one can be saved, if the best things we can do are just, as Paul says, leprous rags in front of God, then how can we possibly be saved from who we are? How can we be changed if we, if we can't do it, well, the obvious answer is God changes. So one of my big proof is when somebody says that they've met God, I wait to see if their life has changed. And I know in my life, I changed. I am infinitely a different person than I was before I met God. Before I met God, I was full of anger. I grew up in an abused home. Yeah. I, I, let me yeah. back up. I, my home wasn't abusive. Mom and dad were great. But there was abuse outside the home right. that I experienced. Uh, and I grew up being very afraid. I was a witness to the most horrific violence a child can ever be witness to. I told you about that. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. And it affected me. I was a strange kid, and I was angry. Mm -hmm. I would reach a point where I was, I, was, I was scared of my own shadow. But there would be a point mm -hmm. where you would push me too far, and I would snap. Mm -hmm. And it, what happened next would have no logic applied to it. When I came to one time, I was slamming this one kid's head into the sidewalk. Mm. Um, and I couldn't fight, dude. I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag. My older brother, younger brother, they could fight. Me? Yeah. And I, I remember asking my, telling my little brother that. I was always jealous of him and my older brother because they could fight and I couldn't. And Pat looked at me and just started laughing. I said, what's funny? Mm -hmm. He said, you don't know, do you? I said, what? The word around school is that you're nuts. And nobody wants to mess with a crazy yeah. man, <laughs> because when you well, went to, yeah. when you got when you he, he said, "Do you remember what happened with so and so that fight?" And I said, "Yeah, I remember it starting." And then I remember you guys yanking me off. And he said, "Yeah, dude, you yanked sticks out of the ground. You were banging mm. this kid's head off the sidewalk. You were going to kill him, and you yeah. were just you weren't there anymore." So that was the kind of person I was. I mean, I could very well have been. That could have turned out a lot worse. Oh. Uh, infinitely worse but when but when i became a christian when i once was confronted with the reality of jesus in boot camp during a black full gospel choir woohoo! i totally recommend that <laughs> uh yeah i i was changed at that moment my temper went from being a the big thing for me is that my temper would smolder and then it would mm -hmm. snap and when it snapped the event that would snap it would be would be a, a, a trivial little thing and my response would be totally out of context to that little thing. After I became a Christian, within about a year, I couldn't bottle it up anymore. I'd get mad, I'd get mad quick, and then it'd be over quick, mm. which is totally weird for me. And now, yeah. at 40 some odd years later, um, people can walk into the room and do stuff that would used to drive me into a rage, 
And I just look at them and laugh now. Yeah. And I can't and I can't believe the lack of anger that's in me. So to me, you know, and that's totally subjective because that's just mm -hmm. Paige's story. Well, well, no, but but it's not. It, it's something, though. Yeah. And, and people, mean, people who know me see the change and they know yeah. something has changed me. So right. to me, that's the power right. of the gospel. You know, Jesus okay. is going to be talking about changing people. Uh, he's going to be talking about changing us. He's going to be talking about um, how we can affect change in our lives. I mean, he's going to be hitting on all mm -hmm. the really hard things that everybody asks these really hard questions about. Who am I? Why am I here? What mm -hmm. can I have to do about me? Because me sucks. I don't like me. Right? <laughs> right. All right. Well, let me let, let, let me put this in your ear before uh, before we adjourn. And maybe maybe you can think about this for the week, um, because I feel like like one of my responsibilities in these dialogues is to come up with things that um, that if you haven't if you haven't thought of them yet, maybe maybe you could think of them in a way to explain it to somebody who's seeking. Uh -huh. Right. So in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God, right? And then Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus Correct. is God. Okay. So I'm thinking about the, the logic of, of God. You know, it's, it's, just, it's kind of akin to those old questions of like, could God create a stone so heavy he can't lift, right. for instance, right? Right. Like, you know, those old, old tired things. Um, and uh, so one of those questions is, could God truly create something out of nothing right um because again nothing is is a very very it's it's an impossible concept for our minds Correct. right um and so you know an artist who paints who creates a painting you know doesn't create the painting so much as rearrange existing materials to become a painting Correct. so fr from that sense you know creation takes on a very very different um idea Correct. So in thinking that that God, you know, God, God, for instance, may be incapable of lying. Right. Mm -hmm. And that would be a limitation placed on God. Um, he, he's not able to lie. So so maybe if another limitation is placed on God, God cannot actually create something out of nothing. So then he would have had to have some pre-existing material to mm -hmm. create the universe and the world from. I see right? where you're going with this. Yes. Right. So, well, where am I going with this? Well, if God had pre-existing stuff to work with, where'd it come from? Right. Right. So, that, so what, it's, it yeah. becomes like a loop. Like, well, that's that's true. Yeah, yeah. The, the God's God idea, and and I think that 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 thought has has some validity to it. Although, you know, then we get into the problem of the infinite regress, and you know, and again, that's like a whole other can of worms. No, actually, what I'm saying <laughs> is that the material that God had to create the universe was God. All right. Right. That that and and so from from that perspective, the spark of divinity, right, that that exists within us, the, the, the source of human dignity, which was brought about in the Renaissance, was the idea that we were specially created by God, but more that we were specially created as part of God. Right, that we we exist as extensions of God because there was no pre-existing material Correct. now. So so Jesus being God, right, as a glorious teacher, um, yeah, and this is this is true in the in the Sikh religion too. You know, the the Sikh word for God is Waheguru, right? Which which uh, a a bad translation of that would be the um, the great remover of darkness. Okay. Right, or the great teacher. Um, so that Jesus is the son of God, but we are all children of God, right? And so, whereas Jesus is special, Jesus is a special creation of God, um, and, and God by extension, but the truth is that because we are all created out of God, we are also God by extension. And uh, now I'll, I'll, I'll take the blasphemy letter <laughs> from, your, from your minister. <laughs> No, you know, you know what? A coward, a man would be a coward not to face things like that face on. Because honestly, yeah. those you're not the first person that's brought that up. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, and I, it, I don't that at all. If you extrapolate that concept out, if we are indeed part of God, mm -hmm. 
then that would negate the whole why we would need salvation thing. Because what would, why would God need to save something that was already him? Okay. I All mean, right. That, that, right off the top of my uh -huh. head, that's where I go with that. But, okay. So okay. I answer that's a question fair. with a question, but— Yeah. No, 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 that, but it's a good question. I think, I, I think, and, and partial support of what you're saying, and C.S. Lewis would go here, he said the fact that man searches for goodness, mm -hmm. man searches, a man innately knows there's something beyond death's curtain, and that man is searching yes. for goodness, and we see that in all the religions and faiths and everything throughout the world, mm -hmm. the, and for all saint, saint general purposes, man is looking to reconnect, he, I, I would say, man is looking to reconnect. Yeah. And, but we can't. And to me, the moral dilemma is that we are so scarred and basically dead to God as sinners that mm -hmm. unless God does something, we're doomed. Because right. the Bible does speak about a very definite thing called hell. I mean. In Matthew's mm -hmm. Gospel, there, there's there's a place called hell, and it's reserved oh. for people who are not believers. And yes. if that's the case, then I would say that hell has no has no place in that person's argument that pre, that that you just presented. Because how would God send God to hell if we're part of God and extensions of God? Yeah. But I can say that I believe we were created in God's image in the sense that we're spiritual beings. We're, tri yes. we're tripartite beings, spirit, body, and mind. I, it's, mm -hmm. You talked about that at the beginning, about the, about, you know, about the, mind, and the, the mind and the brain, you know, it, how they relate. Yes. We're tripartite beings. So I, there's so many things in us that actually reflect God's original design. That, yeah, we're made in his image, but... Until he does something, we can do nothing. I guess is now. I'm thinking with my mouth mm. open here. I, it's I'm not I'm not really smart enough to come up. With, but that's the question well, no, no, I would but, have. But that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and um, you, you know, I I I know we're reaching the end here, and and I wanted to put that in both of our minds, maybe as as something. That if we think about it over the week and some thoughts bubble up, we could discuss it further. Absolutely. Or, you know, yeah, or anybody who, you know, who. Well, what uh, I'll do is watching. I wrote down, um, first of all, d can God have limitations that we talked about? Uh, yeah. And then you talked about one of his names is the great removal, remover of darkness. And then you went on to say that um, if there's a spark of divinity in us, then that really makes us all extensions of God. I mean, that's where that argument, right. how the argument goes. So therefore, right. uh, God is us, we are God kind of thing, which is a principle in several world religions. It, it is, it is. And and I wouldn't want to like, to fall into the new age trap of saying that, you know, like, um, oh, I, I guess it's, you know, I want, I, I, I try to choose my words carefully these days. Um, so the idea that yeah you're leaning pretty far us... you're leaning pretty far to the right now dude oh i know i know <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to tell me <laughs> yeah my conversion is almost complete um... <laughs> pretty soon you'll be going to a baptist church and then it'll be all over yeah 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 <laughs> oh no i have been actually um i have been binge watching sermons of uh the lily grove congregation and um in texas okay the the preacher there oh my gosh it's it's fantastic um but anyway that's that that's a whole other thing um okay so um there's there's this new agey idea that all of us put together are god right right and i don't think that's true right because of course if god is infinite and infinitely powerful right then god wouldn't need very much of himself to create the universe, right? Um, it's, it's kind of like the infinite hotel, right? There's always one more room available. Um, oh, yes, the Eagles knew all about it. So, yeah, <laughs> right. It's in California. I didn't know if you knew that. Yeah. Oh, okay, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Hotel, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, no, that was uh, that was Don Henley. That was... Um, hotel yeah. California. Anyway. Yeah, I digress. Yeah, yeah, any, um, but... Uh, <laughs> 
You know, this isn't right. You and I both push each other down rabbit holes. It's almost I not know, fair. I know, I know, it's terrible. Yeah, but, um, you know, so God God is greater. You know, there's it's like, like that Christian bumper sticker, right? He's greater than I yeah. kind of thing. God God is greater than, than y- 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 you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts idea. Right. Um, and so I guess that an infinite being in a temporal three-dimensional space one dimension of time situation um is is a finite situation right Mm -hmm. and maybe it's within those finite situations that imperfections and problems can occur right because because by creating this three-dimension space one dimension time idea that god has created right he has seemingly from from my perspective purposefully put limitations on things well the fact right? that we're slaves to time says there's there's limitations exactly so i'll leave exactly. i'll leave you then with one return thought to your thought is okay. it is it possible that the fact that s- mankind in general is seeking good you know through all the religions and the faith and everything proof that there is a god because why do you seek for something that doesn't exist right so men are I, but, men are seeking but the fact that, yes. generally speaking, mankind is evil. I mean, just look what's going on around us. Society is just going to hell in a handbasket, right? Man, mankind is capable of great destruction. I think great that's proof that we're not connected to God. That mankind well, in general okay. is not connected. So, I mean, there's it's it's a it's a conflict, it's a tension. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's enough. There's people that are seeking. But there's people that are destroying, and that tells me that mankind as a whole is not connected, and that, generally speaking, the people that find God don't find God so much as God finds them and mm-hmm. changes okay. them. Because, well, we can get into that later on in the Book of Romans. Paul says we're pretty yeah. much we're pretty much screwed. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, all right, but but you say you know it's a it, it's proof of I, I would say it's a proof. a proof, not okay. the proof. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a proof. Yeah. The fact that so many yeah. people are seeking go good says that there's something yeah. in them drawing them towards God in some way, shape, or form, and not saying they get it, but they're mm-hmm. moving in that direction. And the fact that there's so much evil tells us that we're really not connected to God at all. So that would right. fight that argument that we're part of God because how can something that's part of God be so evil? Mm-hmm. I mean, just – Well, oh let's my. pick this – yeah. So let's do, we'll let's pick let's that pick, up. Pick it up next week. We'll pick it up next week. <laughs> I will look at that, and uh, dude, I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. This is a good conversation, man. Absolutely, yeah. my friend. Blessings to you. Talk to you All later. Right. You too, man. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.